Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we're discussing the lectin complement pathway. Okay, right. Uh, so, we've discussed that the mannose binding lectin complex is going to um, come into the interstitial fluid when uh, the permeability of the capillaries and the venules uh, becomes increased due to the inflammatory response. Okay? And then what it's going to do is it's going to find the microbe that is in the interstitial fluid. And if that microbe has polysaccharides or glycoproteins with oligosaccharides attached to them, uh, which have mannose or glucose um, monosaccharides at the terminal position on these polysaccharides or these oligosaccharides, then basically mannose binding lectin complex is going to bind to that uh, mannose or glucose uh, monosaccharide that's on the end of these polysaccharides or oligosaccharides. Okay, so I'm now going to draw um, the mannose binding lectin complex slightly simpler now. So let's show our microbe here with the polysaccharide here. Okay, and let's say it's got this terminal uh, mannose or glucose monosaccharide here. Then basically, I'm going to draw the um, mannose binding lectin complex just as a blob, okay, which represents the uh, MASP1 and MASP2 proteins. And then we'll have these heads coming off, okay. So here are two of these heads. And then we'll draw a few more so that we need six of them. So these are the heads of the mannose binding lectins, okay. So this is the mannose binding lectin complex then. So it's this six mannose binding lectins and uh, two mannose binding lectin associated serine protease twos, and then on top of that, two uh, mannose binding lectins associated serine protease ones. Okay, so this is the mannose binding lectin complex. And if you've watched my uh, video on uh, the classical pathway of complement activation, you'll notice how similar the structure of this is to um, the C1 complex, okay? Uh, in fact, they're believed to probably have a common evolutionary uh, progenitor, basically, uh, a common evolutionary um, origin. Okay, right. So this is the mannose binding lectin complex here. And this will be binding to this polysaccharide or this oligosaccharide within the glycoprotein, whichever one it is, which has this terminal mannose or glucose um, monosaccharide exposed. Okay, right. So now what is this mannose binding lectin complex going to do? Well, it's going to do exactly the same thing as the C1 complex did in uh, the classical pathway. It's going to start acting on two complement proteins which have also come into the interstitial fluid in the inflammatory exudate. Okay, so these two complement proteins are the C2 complement protein here, okay, and then also C4 here. Let's give them a color because they're so important. Right, so let's color in C4 in purple. And let's colour in C2 in not bright green, because we've used bright green for the poly and oligosaccharides. Okay, so in orange, that's C2. Right, okay, so once the mannose binding lectin complex is bound to the mannose or glucose on the uh, surface of the uh, microbe, um, then what's going to happen is the mannose binding lectin complex is going to become active. Okay, so it's now active. And what's going to happen is the mannose binding lectin associated serine proteases, which were at the end of this complex, are now going to start breaking down these two complement proteins here, C2 and C4. Okay, so we'll start with C4. So they're going to break C4 into two fragments, basically. A big fragment here, and then a little fragment here. Okay, so the big fragment is what's known as C4B, and the little fragment is what's known as C4A. Now, C4A doesn't do anything, that just diffuses off, but C4B is extremely important. Okay, so here is C4B, so we ignore C4A, that's just not important. 
Right, okay, so basically, on the surface of this microbe, okay, there will be glycoproteins, which we've already discussed that there will be, because some of these glycoproteins will be what mannose binding lectin complex is bound to. Now, I'm just now going to demote these glycoproteins to instead of being represented as a blob to represent the protein and uh, a green line to represent the oligosaccharide coming off, they're going to be demoted to a, green, sorry, to a blue box here. So these blue boxes are now going to represent glycoproteins. Okay, so basically what's going to happen is that this C4B fragment here is going to go and bind to glycoproteins on the surface of the microbe. Okay, so I'm going to now draw the membrane of the microbe out here again with the glycoprotein here. So I've just transferred this little bit of membrane, if you like, down here and drawn a bigger picture for it. Okay, so here is the glycoprotein in blue. Okay, so I'll just label that up as a glycoprotein on the surface of our microbe. Okay, glycoprotein. And as I say, uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi, all of these could potentially have glycoproteins which can be targeted by this pathway. So what's then going to happen is that the C4B um, fragment is going to bind on top of the glycoprotein here. Okay, so here it is, bound on top of our glycoprotein. Right, okay, so this is C4B. Okay, so now what's going to happen is that mannose binding lectin complex didn't just break down C4, it also broke down C2. Okay, and again it breaks it down into a big fragment and also a small fragment. And here's where I have to tell you something horrible. Okay, there is a horrible piece of nomenclature here. The old names, okay, the names that we used 20, 30 years ago for these things, was that this big fragment was called C2A, and this small fragment was called C2B. So these are the old names. Okay, now, over a decade ago now, what happened is that people who uh, were investigating complement, the complement workers, if you like, they decided that um, we should rename C2A as C2B and rename C2B as C2A. The reason being that they wanted all of the B fragments to be the bigger fragments and they wanted all of the A fragments to be the smaller fragments. Okay, so uh, over a decade ago, what happened is they started renaming the big fragment C2B and the small fragment C2A. So these are the new names. And now, basically, we are left with a total mess where if you go to different sources, some will say that C2A is the important fragment and some will say that C2B is the important fragment. Both sources are are um, referring to this big fragment. The big fragment is the portion that's important. This little fragment does nothing. It goes off with C4A and does nothing. Okay, um, but different sources will refer to this big fragment as C2A and C2B. So some people will use the old nomenclature and some people will use the new nomenclature. So if you just type in complement pathways on Google and look at the pathways and look at different pictures. If you go on Google Images, you'll see blatant contradictions. It just You won't even have to search long. You'll find ones which contradict each other because some of them will tell you that C2A is the important one and some of them will tell you that C2B is the important one. And it looks as though there's just a blatant contradiction here that people just don't know what they're talking about, that there's a complete mess. And in fact, it's just a complete mess with the nomenclature. In my opinion, it was a silly move um, ever thinking to try and rename it the exact opposite way that you were previously named it, okay? Uh, and the old name is still extremely pervasive. And it was the one that I was taught, so I like 
C2A as the name of this bigger fragment. So we're going to use C2A as the name of the bigger fragment, okay? But you will see people refer to it as C2B, so don't let that confuse you. It confused me no end. I had to search and search for a decent explanation. But there you go. Right, so C4B is going to have C2A, this big fragment of C2, uh, stick on top of it. So, C4B has stuck to the glycoprotein on the surface of the microbe, and now what's going to happen is the big fragment that you get from C2, which we're going to call C2A, is going to come and associate on top of C4B. Okay, and this complex here, where you've got C4B now stuck to C2A, is known as a C4B2A complex. However, you will hear people refer to this as the C4B-C2B complex because they'll be using the new nomenclature. Okay, right. So, what does this C4B2A uh, complex now do? Well, it acts on another complement protein, so bring in the next complement protein. So, in comes the next complement protein, which is known as C3. Okay. So we'll have C3 in red, and this is an important complement protein. Okay, so C3 is going to be split down by this complex of C4B with C2A. So the C4B2A complex is going to break C3 again down into a big subunit known as C3B and into a small subunit known as C3A. Okay, and everyone unanimously agrees on these names, so there's no more mess like there is with C2. Everything else is just nice. Okay, so C3B here, the big subunit, and C3A over here. So, we'll start off with one simple uh, thing that C3B does to try and uh, kill the microbe. We'll then skip to C3A, and then we'll come back to C3B. So we're going to uh, skip around a bit. Okay, so we'll start off with one of the things that C3B can do to attack the microbe. So, once C4B and C2A have bound together and have started to convert C3 into C3B and C3A on the surface of the microbe, the C3B that you're producing can now stick to uh, other glycoproteins on the surface of the microbe. So glycoproteins are utterly essential for this entire process. Okay, so let's draw another glycoprotein now on the surface of our microbe. So here, this blue box again, this represents another glycoprotein on the surface of our microbe. Okay, what can happen is the C3B protein fragment can stick onto this glycoprotein like so. So this is C3B. Okay, now what's the point of this? Well, basically, what you're going to end up doing is coating the microbe in C3B. It's going to have C3B stuck all over it. Now, what effect does this have? Well, basically, C3B is what's known as an opsonin. So this is another key word. Okay, so opsonin. And it's going to take part in a process known as opsonization. Opsonization. And some people will spell opsonization with an S rather than a Z. I'll use Z. Okay, so opsonization. So, what is the process of opsonization? Well, basically, one of the key cells in the innate immune system is what's known as a phagocyte. And there are two different type cell types uh, within the innate immune system which are considered phagocytes. Okay, uh, well, actually, there's more, but the two main ones. Okay, so let me explain what a phagocyte is, just in case you have been living in a cave. Right, so if we have a phagocyte here, then basically what phagocytes can do is if they find a microbe, so let's say we've got our little microbe here, what they can do is they can invaginate a little sort of vesicle inside themselves, which will contain this macrophage, they can, uh, sorry, which will contain this microbe. They can start to engulf the microbe. So let me show this happening. So you'll get an invagination like this of the membrane, and the microbe will be contained within it. Okay, so let me show this. Let me colour things in. So here is the microbe in red. Okay, and the microbe is being engulfed. 
So the membrane now has invaginated in like so. So ignore this line here. It's That's gone basically. That's been pushed in. And what can happen is that this can this invagination can completely pinch off to create a little vesicle inside the cell which contains the microbe. Okay, so here is the microbe, still in red, and then you've got the membrane now around the microbe, and the microbe's contained in this separate little storage vesicle down here, and this separate little vesicle containing the microbe is what's known as a phagosome. Okay. Now, what can happen next is that there are a bunch of other little vesicles over here known as lysosomes. Okay, so let me label these up. These are known as lysosomes, and these contain a bunch of horrible enzymes which will break things down, known as lysozymes. Okay, so lyso means to break, lysis means to cut things up into loads of pieces. So lysozymes. Okay, and it shouldn't have been that like that. It should have been lyso zymes like that, I think, rather than the Z there. Okay, so this means an enzyme which is going to break things down. So these lysosomes are full of lysozymes, and what's going to happen is these lysosomes are going to come and fuse with the phagosome membrane and release the lysosomes into the phagocytic, um, va well, this phagocy the space within the phagosome in which the microbe is within. Okay, and then those lysozymes are going to break the microbe down, basically. So, this process of engulfing microbes and then breaking them down is what's known as phagocytosis, okay? And it's carried out by cells known as phagosomes. Oh, sorry, sorry, not phagosomes, phagocytes, okay? And uh, the main two types of phagocytes that you have within the body are neutrophils and monocytes, and in the acute inflammatory response, you get neutrophils and mon macrophages um, swarming into the site of inflammation, basically. So you'll get neutrophils and monocytes, as they're called it, when they're in the bloodstream, but as soon as they leave the bloodstream, they then differentiate into a macrophage. You get these two cell types swarming into the site of inflammation, basically. Okay, and they're going to start uh, engulfing and destroying the pathogen. Now, what does an opsonin do? Well, basically, phagocytes, such as neutrophils and macrophages, have on their surface receptors for C3B. So this is a C3B receptor. Okay, now if it finds a microbe that is covered in C3B, okay, then what it will do is it will be more likely to phagocytose that microbe. So opsonins are often said to be making the microbes more tasty, basically, and that's where the word comes from. Um, so when you coat a microbe in C3B, it basically makes it more tasty for the phagocytes and then more likely to phagocytose it. More seriously, it's a uh, it's a signal that tells the phagocyte that this is definitely something that needs to be phagocytosed. Okay, so the C3B coating of the vesicle, oh, sorry, of the microbe, uh, increases the likelihood that that microbe will be phagocytosed. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.